back in the day when folks were trying to defending the Bible. He said, the Scripture's like a lion. He said, turn it loose. It'll defend itself very well. And we believe that about the Word of God here. That's why I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're heading back into this study, and we will, uh, we will wrestle with this till it pins us to the ground. Uh, we're in the midst of the section 12, 13, 14, where he is addressing spiritual gifts. We read together a portion of chapter 12. We've gone through chapter 13 and 7 installments. In fact, I look back in my notes, I think it was September the 23rd was the last time we were looking at chapter 13. And so we're looking at chapter 14, beginning that today. We'll be in, in this for a while to, to be sure. This is a critical passage. This is, this is the passage unequaled in Scripture to demonstrate that prophecy, preaching, proclaiming, declaring the Word of God in whatever format, this is not, not just for preachers, anybody who declares the Word of God, that speaking the Word of God, speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ is superior to the practice of speaking in tongues. And Paul goes at great lengths to demonstrate that, and I want us to embrace that and understand that. Stand with me if you would. If you found this in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible with you, we've got it up on the screen for you, but we really want you to have your own copy of the Scripture. Uh, you need that. You need that. It's a we're looking at, on, on Wednesday nights at Psalm 119. It's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. We hide its word in our heart that we might not sin against God. You need your own copy of the Scriptures. Follow along in your Bible as I read these 19 verses. We're going to look at verses 1 to 5 today, 19 verses. Where Paul coming off of that, telling us what the greatest of these is. Now abide faith, hope, and love, these three but the greatest is love. Listen to chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Notice something. Verse 2 speaks in a tongue. Verse 4 speaks in a tongue. Verse 5 speak in tongues. It's going to be critical to understanding what Paul is saying here. What have we just read together? We read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to embrace this, to value the Scripture above all else, above experience of value the Scripture. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, Paul's finished up verses 1 through 13 in chapter 13. One, one writer, I think it was Dr. Vaughn, my Greek professor in his commentary, said, By extolling the excellence of love, Paul has prepared his readers to accept the teaching of the present passage, namely, that, quote, the showy gift of tongues on which the Corinthians plumed themselves is inferior to the usual gift of prophecy. He's quoting another commentator there. There's this general affirmation in the early verses of chapter 14, which we just read. Then he compares, really, the rest of, down through verse 25. He starts comparing tongue, speaking in a tongue, and prophecy to, uh, to demonstrate tangibly how critical is uh, this matter of prophecy. Now, prophecy, remember, in the, in the list of, of the gifts that we looked at some time ago now, in the context of the time before the Scripture was completed, prophecy was both forth-telling, declaring, proclaiming, and foretelling, 
telling things that were going to come to pass. Agabus, we pointed out at the time, Agabus the prophet came to Paul bound with his own belt and told Paul that he'd been sent to tell him he's going to go bound to Rome. Um, when the scripture was completed, and we showed you this when we were going through this, these studies, then prophecy as foretelling ceased because God has spoken. This is his final word. Jesus Christ is the final word of God, and now we have in this book, these 66 books we call the Holy Bible, God's final revelation. That's critical. So when he talks about prophecy, he's talking about forth-telling, declaring who God is, who he's revealed himself to be, declaring who Jesus Christ is, why he came, what he accomplished when he died on the cross and rose from the grave and has ascended on high and is returning again at a time kept only to the Father. No, no man, no man on earth knows that time. And somebody that tells you they do, two things. They've broken the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness, and uh, they pretty well guarantee that it won't be then. Who Jesus Christ is. How God works in saving sinful man. Adam and Eve were made upright. But they sinned and all of their posterity with them sinned. We're going to get to 1 Corinthians uh, sometime down the road here. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 is in Adam all died. So in Christ all will be made alive. Each in his own turn. All died in Adam. Romans 5 teaches the same thing. So we're born in this world sinners. Well, what does it mean to be born sinners? Sinners by nature. Demonstrating to anyone paying attention, sinners by choice. As soon as we can choose. What does that mean? Well, it means that God determined in his all-wise mercy and sovereignty and majesty to save sinners from their sins. So he sent his son, Jesus whose very name means he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, from the Old Testament, Yehoshua. Uh, Karen and I met a young woman recently when we were at Sprouts shopping and got into a, quite a conversation. In fact, they closed the store on us and ushered us out. Um, it's fascinating, though. young woman who, who follows Yeshua. And some other things, and of course, the name for Jesus. And we had a very interesting conversation with her. And so Paul is wanting to be sure that we understand. The Corinthians understood, and that we, taking his letter, understand that prophecy, proclaiming, declaring, testifying to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel that God gloriously has given made available to sinners, that that is superior. That you can do no better thing in your life than to share the gospel with somebody. We spent most of prayer meeting Wednesday night hearing stories of our folks at prayer meeting about people they're sharing the gospel with. It was just, uh, it's exhilarating when, you, when that's happening. You'll leave no better legacy to your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, than to speak the gospel to them. You could have great experiences, but the experiences will always be inferior to prophecy. And so I want you to understand what we're talking about here. When we say prophecy, we're covering the idea of the revelation of Scripture, God's Word, and our privilege to speak God's Word to others. Well, you're going to see this passage unfold, these 40 verses. First of all, the importance of tongues as a secondary to prophecy. That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, beyond that, just real quickly, the purpose of tongues as a sign to unbelievers and the, and the practice of tongues being systematic and orderly. Paul goes after that in these 40 verses. But today, we're going to drill down, hopefully look at the first five verses, the importance of tongues secondary to prophecy. And specifically, all are edified by prophecy. Notice the contrast he gives here. I want to read those five verses again. 
Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Remember I told you that spiritual gifts, the charismata, were given for us to use to, to edify one another in the church and build it up and strengthen it. That's key because Paul's talking about that here. Verse 5, now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So he starts out this, this chapter, having moved from, from the idea of, of these three that abide in love abiding always, to say pursue love. The word pursue there is the same word that's used in Hebrews 12 uh, for persecution, for, for when it says uh, that you need to pursue holiness. It's, it's the word that was used of Paul when he persecuted the church. He, he was in hot pursuit of followers of Christ to lay hold of them, and as happened in the case of Stephen, to stone them to death. That's the, that's the word that's used. It's not, a, it's not a casual, well, it would know, be nice if I, if, if I, no, no, no. Hot pursuit. Pursue love. Because without agape love, you can do a lot of amazing things, but it sends the wrong message. Because the message would be that, that these great things can be accomplished apart from, from a love birthed in us by the Spirit of God in the new birth that inevitably inevitably flows out of us. Just as the scripture says anything not done in faith is sin, I think you could say anything not done flowing out of agape love is in the category of sin, even a glorious sin, even a great benevolent sin. Pursue love and then akin to that earnestly desire. These are powerful words Paul is using here. It's his contention that if the Corinthians would pursue love rather than to pursue what, uh, what, what my Greek professor called or quoted as saying the showy, uh, the showy, that's what was happening in Corinth was for show. You, you've seen this before, I know. People putting on airs. People liking to have a, have a show, have a crowd, have, a, have an audience, have a gathering. Uh, we have to be careful. That's, that's in all of us. Even the shyest person you know deep down somewhere wants that. Paul says that's what's going on in Corinth and it's not right. And a pursuit, a hot pursuit of agape love will, will keep that in check. Will literally, will starve that inclination to death. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts which he's laid out in chapter 12. And we looked at that for several weeks. We looked at 12, chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians. We looked at Romans, that section. Uh, and then we looked at Ephesians 4, where the, where the gifts, uh, various gifts are listed. Desire that. Again, if the attitude is, I don't need, I don't need any spiritual gifts, or as the, as the common vernacular, I don't need no stinking spiritual gifts. No, you, you, <laughs> you need to recognize the spiritual gifts are the inevitable outflow. They were, they were part of the package you and I received when we were born again. So the, the evangelical attitude, the gospel attitude is to desire. And you, you may say, well, Pastor, I don't know my... Then desire to know them. Earnestly desire to know them. Go back and read through the list again. I, I encourage you when we did that several Sundays in a row to read over this and pray, dear God, show me. If, if I'm not clear, show me. And it's... Uh, Talk to people you trust and say, I want to lay myself out to you here. In these lists of spiritual gifts, what do you see in me? And listen. This is iron sharpening iron. This is, this is us speaking the truth and love to one another. This is us edifying one another. Earnestly desire that. And then he says, especially. So you see where he's going. That you may prophesy. That you may tell forth. 
Now, all are commanded to share the gospel. Not all have the gift of prophecy. With that passage we read from chapter 12 toward the end, we told you when we went through that, do all prophesy? It, there's, those are rhetorical questions. All don't prophesy, do they? All don't speak in tongues, do they? All don't interpret, do they? That, that, that's how the question is asked when you look at the, at the language, the, the Greek language there. And it's going to be important when we get to, down to verse 5 when he says what he says there. So all are commanded to share the gospel. You should pray for one another that God will strengthen in, in your spouse, in your, in your peers, in your children, your grandchildren. Strengthen them. It would be wonderful for God to raise every one of you in this place up to teach a group, whether it's a teaching a group of women in your home and speaking the truth, that's prophesying. That's telling forth the gospel. Whether it's in a, in a Bible study class here, whether it's in various parts of the ministry, whether if God would raise up young men to, to uh, follow uh, the Lord in, the, in gospel ministry, we ought to be praying that for one another because Paul says, earnestly desire especially this. So I want you to get the notion out of your head that this is for preachers only. That's not what he's, Paul is not saying, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that all of you become preachers. That's not what he's saying. So we've got to understand him here. Especially that you, plural, may prophesy. In fact, when you look at that, you could almost say that the whole church should desire that that gift be highlighted in their congregation, which it was not in Corinth. What do you suppose was being highlighted in Corinth based on what we know from chapter 12, 13, and 14? It was the ecstatic gifts, tongues being among them. And so then he goes ahead and says in verse 2, for, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. Now I want to Years ago when I was studying this, in fact, that was back when I was in, in seminary. That was, a, that was a long time ago. I graduated from seminary in my, my master's in 78. That was, that was a good 40 years ago. Uh, going through a class on 1 Corinthians, it struck me because it did not make sense what Paul was arguing for in the light of his other arguments here. And I, and I, I just observed at the time, is he, is he being sarcastic here? Is he... Is he simply giving them their argument before he takes on his? And I really believe that's what he's doing. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine how encouraged I was when, when years later I laid hold of uh, John MacArthur's commentary on 1 Corinthians. And that's what he says. He says that he believes that Paul is being sarcastic here. I want you to listen now. He's, I believe he is saying he's not putting his imprimatur of approval on this, he is saying, here's, here's what you're saying to me. For one who speaks in a tongue, and I think, uh, I don't have my King James in front of me. Has anybody got a King James Bible? Does it say unknown tongue there? Okay, yeah. And what's happened is that, that the King James translators recognize the singular use, a tongue, as opposed to tongues, plural, that's used in here. And so they tried to distinguish that because you, you wouldn't, it wouldn't show up in English for you by adding unknown there. This, this unknown tongue. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. That was their argument. What? Fathers say, well, that's, there's, nothing, there's nothing edifying about what you're doing in terms of, of what we've learned, what Paul taught us about the charismata being used to build up the church. And they would say, well, I'm... I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to God. This is, my, this is my heavenly language. I had a fellow tell me that years ago, decades ago now. I said, well, I, we, I began to talk with him. Uh, and he said, well, I just want you to know I speak in tongues. And I said, really, tell me about that. And, and uh, he said, well, it's just my, it's a heavenly prayer, prayer language. And I said, but it's a part of the whole charismata package that's supposed to, how does, how's the church built up in that? Well, it's, uh, it's not. And he actually went to this verse. He said, I'm not speaking to the church. I'm speaking to God. Paul's not approving of this argument here. For no one understands him. You take this and superimpose this in the context of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. 
and tell me that he's approving of this. There's no, there's no way you can walk away from the passage because he's, if he is, he is totally abandoned where he was going in 12 and 13. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. This word mysteries in the Greek, we told you about it before. We looked at it in Ephesians. It's the word musterion. It's not, it's not translated. Mysteries is not translated from some other Greek word. It's transliterated. Musterion becomes mystery. It is the, in its best use, the mystery of godliness is God revealing that the eternal Son of God came from heaven to be a, become a man on earth for a season to die for sinners. That's the mystery of godliness, God becoming man. So Paul is using this word here, but notice how he's using it. He's uttering mysteries in the Spirit. That's their argument. Which is revealing nothing. It's not even, it's not even the way that the folks would have embraced the word mysterion. He's taking their argument. and says, this is what you say is going on. That's basically what I read here. No one understands him. Well, that, if no one understands, that, that scratches that practice from the list of the charismata that is designed to bless and build up. I went to Russia well, 20 years ago now, I suppose, to teach some pastors there. Picked up a few Russian phrases. If I got up here and said, Dobre uche, do svidanya, pejalta. He said, I don't understand a thing you're saying. Exactly. And the only place that's meaningful is the midst of people who know Russian. But I learned it's also dangerous to throw out a few Russian words. Because when Russians hear you use Russian words, you know what? They think you can speak Russian. And you know what they do? They take off 90 miles an hour speaking Russian. And all I had was the Spanish no comprende. And my, that didn't mean anything to them either. So, but you see what he's going after here. He's beginning to dis disqualify. No one understands. In fact, one writer said that when Paul uses mysteries here, he has in mind those that were associated with the pagan mystery religions, that he's basically saying to them, when you do this, you're identifying more with, with pagan ecstatic utterance than you are with gospel proclamation. That's the contrast he's going for here. Verse 3, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. That fits exactly the purpose of the charismata, of the spiritual gifts, to build one another up. Karen and I were built up last night. We were so greatly encouraged. It was, it was pretty daunting. To, uh, we've had, our children have helped us paint uh, various portions of the house and looking at that and thinking, oh my goodness, you got that. <sighs> We've got to get it done. We do want to have these, our brothers come in, brothers and sisters come in from Haiti. We want to house them. We want, we want that to be a blessed experience for them. And we were, we were edified. Uh, you could say our socks, we, they edified our socks off last night, coming in and, and painting because it was done in a couple of hours. So now it's done. All we've got to do now is get everything back in place and let Karen put her touch on it, you know. Uh, that she has to make it just look like something that, uh, that hotels will be jealous of. On the other hand, the one who prophesies, who speaks, who proclaims, speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. This is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. And you can't say that about, about speaking in a tongue being profitable. The best argument they can make is, well, it's profitable for me. Well, boy, doesn't that fit in the me generation. But is it profitable for the body? All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, instruction, for correction. I mean, for all the, all the tools we need to exhort and encourage one another on the way, along the way. Then he says in verse 4, the one who speaks in a tongue 
builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. <laughs> if you've ever had any conversations with folks all over this past, well, am I, am I not entitled to being built up? Well, sure you are. You're supposed to be built up by the church, and you're supposed to build others up. Paul is not approving of the practice. He is contrasting here how what they claim to be doing goes totally in the face of the purpose of the charismata. So build yourself up, build the church up. We're supposed to spend our time glorifying God, <laughs> exalting Jesus Christ, building up one another, advancing the gospel locally and around the world. That's And it's not surprising, by the way, that this stuff has taken hold and taken off at the same time that the, that the baby boomers have populated uh, the West and make it all about themselves. This is not a coincidence that the me generation, if it feels good, do it. That's what I heard growing up. Well... Jump, if it feels good to you, do it. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about us. It's about others. And Paul is going after this here. That's where John MacArthur says, I believe Paul's point here is sarcasm. And he points out that we've already seen sarcasm in chapter 4. Uh, and we'll see it again later on in this passage. Uh, when he challenges them to say, or, or is, is the Word of God original with you guys? You think you're the first ones to wrestle with this? See, let's look at verse 5. I want to wrap this up. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. He's, say, he's stating here something that is an impossibility based upon what he asked at the end of chapter 12. This is proof, I think, either, either Paul is schizophrenic, which I don't want to, I'm not going to believe that, or he is, he is using sarcasm to show them how off the beaten path, how off the bullseye they are. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. It uses the plural tongues. He didn't say, I want you all to speak in a tongue. But even more to prophesy. I want you all to prophesy. But the one who, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So the question is asked, I want to read you John MacArthur here, this was very helpful. Why many people wonder, did Paul say, I wish that you all spoke in tongues? He's been warning them about their abuse of tongues and is beginning a chapter devoted to showing the inferiority of tongues. Why would he have wanted the problem to be compounded by everyone, getting everyone involved? And here's where he, I think he hits the bullseye. But Paul was wishing the impossible for the sake of emphasis. He knew that all Christians do not have the same gifts, chapter 12, verse 30. The apostle certainly was not suggesting that his wisdom was, was greater than the Holy Spirit. No. To have wished literally that all the Corinthian believers had the gift of tongues would have presumed to improve on the Spirit's wisdom, who gives severally as he wills. Paul is, simply was making it clear that he did not despise the genuine gift of tongues, plural, the true manifestation of which is of God. In fact, here's what MacArthur says. If the Holy Spirit chose to endow every one of you with the gift of tongues, he was saying, that would be fine with me. Just as with prophecy, by the way. And then this was where I thought was critical. We're going to leave with this today. It's an interpretive key to this chapter to note that in verses 2 and 4, tongue is singular. Whereas in verse 5, Paul uses the plural tongues. And you've got to keep, as you're reading through this passage, keep that in mind. Apparently, the apostle used the singular form to indicate the counterfeited gift and the plural to indicate the true gift. There is a true gift of tongues. Recognizing that distinction may be the reason, and I said earlier, the King James translators supply unknown with it. The singular use of the false the singular is used to the false because gibberish is singular. It cannot be gibberishes. He was speaking gibberish. 
There are no kinds of pagan ecstatic speech. There are, however, kinds of languages in the true gift for which the plural tongues is used. We've got to keep that separate as we go through this passage. That when we're talking about tongues, we're talking about the supernatural enabling of someone to speak in another language. Now, I've been around long enough and have talked to enough missionaries to know that some have come off the field saddened and disappointed. I have dear friends of ours who went to Japan and could never learn the language, and it was mortifying to them. We have other friends who've gone to the mission field and, and with incredible ease adapt to the language though they had never grown up with it. Language training comes easily for them. And then I've known of a couple of cases where folks have testified that they were in a situation, they were speaking in another language, shocking, shockingly to them, and were approached by someone who said, tell me more. And they said, tell you more what? They said, you were just speaking in my language, and you were talking about a Savior, a Messiah, tell me more. Our God is able to do that. But this idea of, a, of, of what I call multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish. Multisyllabic means it's, there's several syllables. Unintelligible, when you're hearing it, you don't have any idea what's being said. And it goes in the category of gibberish. Because, folks, God is a God of order. I mean, even, even the folks in the deepest, darkest portions of the world. Mary, I don't know what the folks spoke in Papua New Guinea, but there, there are tribes out there that here's how they speak. And we go, what in the world? And it's, been, it's translated. It's going to be translated. And when you translate it, it's always the same. And here's the final thing I'm going to leave you with. Any assertion that speaking in tongues has occurred where you could write down the syllables, and you should be able to write it down if it's spoken, you can hear and put down the syllables, then those syllables and their order that form whatever they're forming will mean the same thing. Shalamah doesn't mean one thing when it pops up here and something else when it pops up down here. Our God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of decency. He's a God of order. He's the one who gave language. He gave to our first parents, Adam and Eve, the capacity for rational communication with themselves and with him. The judgment he placed upon the earth was Babel. It separated people. The blessing was when Pentecost reversed Babel for a brief few moments there to show that God had come to bring people back to himself and to one another. So you've got to put your thinking cap on here, folks, but this is a critical passage in the Scripture to understand. Help us to love and pray for, not be, not be mean toward, but if you have friends that are caught up in the charismatic experience, speaking in unknown tongues and calling that the outworking of the, of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 and other places, pray for them that their eyes might be opened. God did not save us to turn us into pagans who babble. He saved us, called us to glorify Him, to exalt His Son, to advance His gospel, even in arenas where we're breaking language barriers to get the gospel to those who've never heard it before. That's the beauty and the usefulness of the gift of tongues. And when tongues is spoken in a congregation and no one understands, the necessity that there be an interpretation given of it. I'll tell you right now, 40 years of ministering, I've stood on this. Anyone were to stand and begin to speak in another language or in multisyllabic unintelligible gibberish, they would be asked immediately to give an interpretation and if none can be given, to be quiet. That's what Paul's going to say when we get on in chapter 14. 
Our God's a God of order, not a God of confusion. And when he gave the charismata, he gave them to build up the body, that the body might be strong, energized, focused, and able to take the gospel to the neighborhoods around them and the nations around the world. Now, this will make no sense to you unless you have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because in you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you will bear witness to truth. You may not have heard truth before, but when you hear truth, you respond to it because the truth sets you free. The truth is food for your soul. And as best I can, with God being my helper, I want to tell you the truth about these things, that we might rejoice in the full, the full experience of the spiritual gifts for the church. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you today in Jesus' name. We thank you for all that you have given us, chiefly, most importantly, you've given us Jesus Christ to be the Savior of sinners, of all sinners who will repent of their sins and confess faith in him to be Lord and Savior. And we know that you've enabled us to do that by the Holy Spirit that you've given us in the new birth to come and, and bring us from darkness to light, from death to life, from, from uh, helplessness to, to wholeness, that he does that work. And we recognize that in that, that for all here who've been born again, within that experience, within that glorious reality, you planted in us the charismata, various charismata for each one of us to, to discover, cultivate, use, and bless the body of Christ. So help us to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying. Help us to walk along the path to stay out of the, the ditch of censoriousness, uh, superficiality, and stay out of the ditch that would have us make more of some of these things than the Apostle Paul himself did. Help us, to, help us to just renew our commitment to the superiority of your word, your Bible, and the commitment to declare that to one another, to the neighbors, and the nations. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with